Good evening and a very warm welcome to Murder One. We're back online and in person in our first hybrid festival. My name is Sam Blake and I'm the founder and director of Murder One and I'm thrilled that you can join us tonight for our opening event. This is our first interview um, of our season uh, this year. This year Murder One is supported by Dunleary Rathdown Libraries with our in-person events running at the stunning Lexicon venue in Dunleary. But this year we're also supported by the Arts Council Ireland which is enabling us to live stream many of our events, making Murder one as accessible um, as possible to everybody on their laptops and so you can watch um, from home just as you can now. This evening we're joined by the incredible Laura Lippmann who will be chatting to award-winning novelist, playwright and critic Declan Hughes about all things crime. I'll pass you over to Declan. Thanks Sam. Laura Lippmann published her first novel Baltimore Blues in 1997. In the 25 years since She's published a further 11 books featuring P.I. Tess Monaghan, 12 standalone novels, most recently Dream Girl, two story collections, and My Life as a Villainous, a collection of personal essays. Her work has been nominated for all the major crime fiction awards and has won most of them. She is a New York Times bestselling author. Laura is the link between the pioneering novels of Sue Grafton, Sarah Paretsky, and Marcia Muller, and a newer generation that includes Gillian Flynn, Megan Abbott, and Alison Galen. Her most recent book is Seasonal Work, a collection of short stories. Happy silver anniversary, Laura. <laughs> Thanks, I like thinking of it that way. It sounds, it makes me feel, it doesn't make me feel old, but I love the idea that I'm a, a connection, especially to the three younger women that you named, all of whom I admire and I'm really fond of. So. I think they all see you as a as a huge influence. Um, but we'll talk about that uh, a little later. Um, I want to disobey Oscar Hammerstein's injunction to start <laughs> at the very beginning. Um, and there's a link here. You'll get it. Uh, in the afterword to the new collection, uh, you adapt a quote from uh, Merrily We Roll Along, written, of course, by... Oscar Hammerstein's apprentice, uh, Stephen Sondheim, to describe how you decide to write a short story. Could you tell us about that, please? Um, I believe I wrote, we generally start with the contract, which, <laughs> uh, and that is just the cold mercenary truth. I don't think writers should be ashamed of wanting to write for money. Mm -hmm. And I think, in fact, that it's more important than ever. There's a lot of um, free stuff being made available. And I sometimes feel like maybe I'm just a dinosaur, maybe I'm archaic, maybe I'm insensitive to what the business is like now as I watch friends trying to break in and it has new and different challenges. I still think people should be paid for their work. And... Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that it's it's a really bad deal for writers to, to give it away too often. I mean, I've, I've written this or that for free. Mm -hmm. And it's not even the amount of money, but just the idea that some sort of compensation should, um, should be exchanged. I mean, of the stories in seasonal work, my hunch is that there was one story that earned more than all the other stories put together. Oh my, and which one was that? That was the story that was commissioned by Amazon um, called Slow Burner. Oh yeah, which is fantastic. Which Thank is one you. Of the yeah. And the, and the joke was at the time, I wanted to buy a really nice sofa. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to buy a much nicer sofa than I had any right to buy. And Amazon happened to, pop up um, via another writer and Jonathan Santelofer like said, would you consider writing a, a novella or a longer short story? I think the theme was really broad. It was something like lying or betrayal. And I was like, yeah, I really need a sofa. Mm -hmm. And I just don't find anything wrong with that being a starting place for some of the work that we do because I've always maintained that we shouldn't be precious about it. I mean, yes, it's creative. And yes, I'm very lucky to do it. And yes, when I'm doing it, I'm not thinking about the money. But I don't 
mind. I mean, I was a newspaper reporter for 20 years. And if you look at it that way, I had essentially a contract with the newspaper that I would show up for work and I would write things and they would pay me for it. Yeah. And so I've just, I've been a professional writer since I graduated from college. There were actually six months, my first six months out of college, I couldn't quite make ends meet. So I worked at the best Italian restaurant in Waco, Texas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I needed that tip money. But after those six months were over and I got like a slight bump in salary, this is all I've ever done is be a writer for pay. Sure. And so, yeah. So every short story in that collection began with the offer of some sort of payment. Um, hilariously, one of them was contracted and I misread the directions. Like, you know, the story needs to be this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. And I wrote it and it was completely wrong for what I had agreed to do. So that story is the title story, Seasonal Work. And I did end up basically giving that away. Okay. Because, but that was my fault because I didn't read the directions. <laughs> Well, I am delighted to hear your emphasis on paying the writer. Uh, one of my uh, side gigs is as a uh, literature advisor to the Irish Arts Council. And uh, that's basically following up organizations like the one Sam runs and saying, you're paying them what? Pay them more. You know, what rates do these magazines pay? Pay more. That's all I ever do. I just say, pay, pay the writers more. The writers could be paid more. Um, Thank you. I think it's solid philosophy. Um uh, it's interesting, though, the markets are not, I mean, and tell me maybe in 1997 or earlier, because I, I, you know, I published with Alfred Hitchcock or Ellery Queen or one of those, and and uh, it's, they're pitiful, those rates now. There used to be a, a golden age of magazine publishing where a writer could just about carve out a living if he was or she was willing or unable to publish en- enough short stories. That's definitely long gone. That yeah. I, I don't. I don't know anyone who is, let me try to think about this, you know, are there people who, if they were still with us, I'm thinking about Alice Munro, people who were sort of New Yorker regulars, I don't think anyone could do it. I don't think anyone could support themselves as a short story writer relying on magazines right now. I do think that's over, I think, I think freelancing for magazines, I mean, I, I meet people who worked at places like Vanity Fair and other glossy magazines in the heydays when they could pretty much, they could actually get contracts for yeah. X dollars a year that were good. I think for most people that's gone. Yeah. And that's a shame, but it's also important that the new venues that come in to replace us, okay, so they're online, why can't they pay? You know, this idea, and it's what's interesting to me and very gratifying is some of the places will be like, Oh, we couldn't begin to pay you well, but then they'll pay me like 50 cents a word, which I think is pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I recently agreed to write an essay for someone who's going to pay me $3 a word. I was like, really? That's a lot of money. I've never gotten that before. That's great. I mean, really, I think the best amount of money I ever have gotten was a kill fee from Vogue which contracted with something and judged it just no way. Yeah. No way up to their standards. But the kill fee was incredibly attractive. I'm like, oh, I would do this more often. Lest we sound like uh, George Bernard Shaw in Sam Goldwyn's office when he said, uh, <laughs> oh, you, you've, you're confused, Mr. Goldwyn. All, all you want to talk about is art and all I want to talk about is money. Um, I, I should emphasize the, the, the quality of these stories is considerable. I mean... Sl- slow burner just one more the one you wrote specifically for the book um and seasonal work the title story are all are all really outstanding i mean just to single those out but i think my favorite is one in which nobody dies uh although there might be the the death of a heart a youthful heart the last of sheila lock holmes oh. um it's such a poignant uh, story uh, and and uh, I was supervising a thesis this year, a student writing from the point of view of a daughter whose uh, parents' uh, marriage was clearly in trouble, except she didn't understand. Well, she could see were signs that didn't make any sense to her. Um, and I said, "You've got to read this." Um, tell, oh. tell me, tell me about that story and and where it came from. That story came from um, someone reaching out to me and saying, "Can you write a story?" that 
has something to do with Sherlock Holmes. And one of my uh, no longer secrets, because I'm about to reveal it, is I'm not particularly well read in Sherlock Holmes. Mm. I mean, obviously I've read some of them and I've seen a lot of the films and I enjoy them. And a friend even persuaded me to watch this new show called Elementary, which is sort of a play on Sherlock Holmes in modern times. Mm. I've never been a big fan of crime series that are about someone who's superior to everyone else. Yeah. It's just not for me. I mean, they're, I, I don't. He's a superhero, you feel, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. You feel, and you also kind of feel like you're the butt of the joke. You, you feel like you're Watson a big part of the time. Like, oh, you're just there to marvel at their, I mean, I mean Nancy Drew is actually one of those characters. She's perfect. And everyone around her is just there to sort of sing of her perfection. So I was like, what would I have to say about Sherlock Holmes? And the fact of the matter is, is I did in fact have a deer stalker cat when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and, and girls my age were very much under the influence of a book called Harriet the Spy, which was hugely popular in the United States. I have no idea. But it was about a little girl who lived a very privileged upper middle class life on the Upper East Side of New York in the 60s who spied on all her neighbors and wrote down everything in a notebook and then was surprised when people found the notebooks and got mad at the way they'd been written about. Huge influence on me. It's, it's in a lot of women that I know. And I've always been a bit of a spy. I've always been someone who goes through medicine cabinets when I'm babysitting and, you know, pokes around in places. And it's part of the writer's MO, really, isn't it? Yeah. And so... And I think that I had actually had the experience of seeing something I wish I hadn't seen and thinking about that, like thinking about how children make sense of adult lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something, there's a writer in our field, Lee Goldberg, and I don't know why this has always stuck with me, but when his daughter was young, she was just astonished to find out that her mother had been married before. Mm. And she's like, blew her mind. And she's like, she, I think, I think as I remember the story, she went to her father and said, did you know that mom had been married before? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I, and I think also on the larger issue, almost everything I write is about people having one piece of a puzzle and thinking they know everything. Mm -hmm. And it's all about context and how do stories get put together and the danger of thinking, you know, okay, so you're looking at it from this angle and you think you know everything, but what if we switch up the POV? What's, it, what's over there? Who sees this? Um, that every story can be inverted so that the hero is the villain and the villain is the hero. So, I mean, that story is, that story predates me being a mom. I right. know that, but okay. I was a stepmom at the time. And and I had been that kind of kid. Sheila was, and also there's a little bit of, um, there's a little sound time tribute in there because of course the last of Sheila is the film that he made with Anthony Perkins. Right. So I was getting all my favorite references in. But it's, but it's her sad intimation of adulthood uh, stroke mortality, you know, at 11, which I think is exactly the right age where, where things, get poisonous and they've become poisonous at school. Yeah. Sheila. Yeah. And kids begin to figure stuff out and they lose. It's, it is an age where you see kids beginning to lose their innocence. Even if it's just something as simple as my daughter was 11 when I finally had to confess there was no Santa Claus. Yeah. And she had figured out the tooth fairy. She set a trap. She had yeah. this whole thing where she, lost a tooth and put it under her pillow without telling anyone. Mm -hmm. And then she summoned me to her room and she's like, I put this tooth under my pillow last night and mm -hmm. I didn't tell you and I didn't get any money. So that's how I know you're the tooth fairy. Okay. But tellingly, she did not want to interrogate Santa Claus's existence. I still I don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I'm sorry. It's yeah. totally true. It's, if you believe he comes, but um, and it and it came up in a very funny way. It came up with me telling my daughter a story about her Christmas stocking, 
And as I was telling the story, I realized if I keep telling the story, I have to tell her that Santa doesn't exist. And she sort of knew. She knew. Yeah. But by, by the way, we still hang our stockings because yeah, of they're course. just fun. It's the best yeah. part of Christmas. And you never know, you know. Um, <laughs> But also you're anxious for, you know, if her some mean girl thinks she's, you know, right. be and you know, it's you're so anxious for them at that age that they're gonna be bullied. Um yeah, no, I love that story. Um I like do I detect triads there? I think is is Snowflake Times John Doyle a, a triad for Jerry Anderson uh in, in <laughs> Dream Girl? So that was that was the story that I wrote after writing seasonal work, which I was writing, the, the parameters were write a story that takes place at Christmas time. Okay, got that part right. And it had to have some kind of connection to the mysterious bookshop in New York City. I had and I, and so um, I think it was at a time when there'd been, a, it, was, it was Me Too, there'd mm -hmm. been all the lawsuits against Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. But it was also an opportunity to write about cozies, which actually I have a lot of respect for traditional mysteries, so-called cozies. Mm. I think they're difficult to write. I think that the best ones are really marvelous and admirable. But, you know, also I can't help but having an attitude about every hack who thinks he can write a mystery series. And so sitting down and trying to come up with a mystery series that would be ghostwritten by another person. Mm. And that would just sort of be like a bunch of boxes to tick to appeal to your um, conservative audience. You right. know, the idea of you can't say Merry Christmas anymore. So it takes place in Christmas, Ohio. And I mean, I think it's bad form to laugh at your own work. I still laugh at Snowflake Time whenever I read about the story within the story. Yeah. When I, yeah. When I, whenever I come across the name of the woman who runs the local coffee shop, which is Carlotta Mandible, mm -hmm. I just laugh. I'm just like, this is ridiculous. And I can't believe it doesn't exist. That was, mm. I mean, I had to write it fast because I'd screwed up. Yeah. And I had to, you know, that's the case where you sit down and you're like, I don't have any margin for error here. And short stories are super hard. I mean, part of the reason I don't write more of them is because it's it's so much harder than a novel. Yeah, there's nowhere to hide. It's like you can't have anything wrong. You, you know, it's like you you can't have a wasted line. I mean, I'm sure I do, but you shouldn't. They have mm. to be tight. They they can't be forgiven anything. Novels can be forgiven a thing here yeah. or there. Of course, yeah, yeah. But not a short story. So I had a very little time. So I, I think I had to actually kind of outline that story. And ultimately, it's a story in which I'm making fun of writers. So therefore, I'm making fun of myself. Yeah. In the last line of that story, that's as much about me as it is about the horrible man in it. <laughs> but yeah, he, he actually, I mean, I think he makes Jerry look good. I have a yeah. much more complicated relationship with Jerry Anderson because... God help me, Jerry and I agree on a lot of stuff. Oh, I see that. I see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. No, he's a broad. He's a broad version of. You know, let's 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 jump. I'm, I'm going to cut back because I want to look at that. Talk about the accidental housewife as well, which is which I think is a a sort of triad or at least links to the lady in the lake. But um, <laughs> but Dream Girl, you've called about the horror of, of of what goes on inside a writer's mind. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I agree with Jerry about a lot of stuff, not about his attitudes toward women, not about mm. his behavior, mm. but some of his old man fussiness yeah. is definitely like, like, yeah, when people don't know what words mean, sometimes I get frustrated. I don't mind the way language changes to be kinder and more compassionate and more inclusive. Mm. That I think is great. And I do think that, you know, Jerry is wrong in his sort of interest in what every non-white person is. Like when someone's non-white, he's like, where are they from? Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, no, Jerry, no, stop that. 
but there are just some ideas he has about the world at large and literature and people who want to be writers without being readers. Yeah. And in, in his, I'm thinking about this because Peter Straub died recently, and I just read a lovely piece by his daughter in his honor. And, you know, I absolutely agree with Jerry that Ghost Story is one of the greatest horror novels ever written. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was great fun to play with Jerry's reading taste that are, that are often mine, but not completely mine. And I, I just, he's horrible, but I can't disavow him. But isn't that true of all the characters we create? How well, can we disavow them? We made them up. I know. We made them I know. Up. I know. But 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 it is. It's kind of like the the sort of unrestrained id version of what a writer is like. I mean, when I I reviewed it and I I I, I said he was over fastidious, mean, self obsessed, <laughs> completely lacking collegiate fellow feeling. But I love that lacking in collegiate fellow feeling, which I don't think applies to you. But I know writers, and you say, "Oh, I'm reading this new book by such and such a person," and they say, "Oh, do you think it's any good?" Like, it's inconceivable that it could be any good, or they've already dismissed it in yeah. some way or other. And and it's like over and over again, he hits that mark hilariously. Um, yeah, but he's, he's also, he's witty, he's hilariously thin-skinned. But, but I think the thing I find redemptive about him is he's almost heroically committed to the writing life, you know? Um, he, that's his dedication. And as a guild member... You, you've got to say, even if he's an asshole, he's our asshole. <laughs> you know? And also, he's committed to the idea that there is such a thing as a novel that comes from a writer's imagination. Mm -hmm. That everything is not a thinly disguised real life story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, I mean, and Jerry wrote a true work of imagination. He 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 saw a tiny little thing and he turned that into a novel. And no one believes it. Mm. No one believes him because, and I think this is something, now I've admittedly muddied the waters because I often am and I'm often very upfront when I've been influenced by a real life story. Mm -hmm. That's, and I was recently confronted by someone who had a connection to one of the real life stories that had been a springboard for one of my books. And they said, don't you think, and this is in a public forum. Mm -hmm. And they said, don't you think you should have gotten in touch with my brother and me before you wrote that book. He was the son of a woman, Shirley Parker, whose body was found in the fountain at the lake at the local zoo. And that was clearly a jumping off point for Lady in the Lake. Right. And when he stood up and asked me that at an event this summer, I said, this is an incredibly complicated topic. And five years ago, I would have said to you, no, I didn't know you that. And I said, my ideas about this are changing and they're going to continue to change. And I wish I had talked to you and your brother, but not to seek permission or not to imply that I was writing about your mother because I'm not writing about your mother. Yeah. I was interested in this one detail about the death of a black woman that would have gone completely ignored if it were not for the odd place her body was discovered. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, like, like the daily newspapers did not write about your mother's disappearance until she was found. Yeah. And he, and he said, no, the, the Afro-American did. I said, the Afro-American, I believe, was weekly at the time. The daily white press ignored your mother's death. I was interested in that single fact. And I made up a person and I made up her life story and her life story ends very differently from your mother's life story. It's very different. I said, all of that said, I wish I had talked to you ahead of time just to talk to you, to be kind, to prepare you for what it would be like. Of course, at the time I'm writing it, I don't know that the book is going to be successful. You never know. It was a successful book. And I definitely don't know it's going to become a a production filming in my hometown with big stars in it. I don't know any of that. And I think that heightened. And so all of that is to say that one of the things I loved about writing Dream Girl is that no one thought it was autobiographical or factual. 
people saw clearly that it was a tribute to misery yeah. and some other books that were deeply meaningful to me. And it was just so much fun to be able to say, look, sometimes we just make stuff up. Do you not get that? Yeah. Everything isn't. And I think that um, the appetite for podcast has heightened this idea that there are no made up stories. Yeah. That everything's just a true story and it's a matter of degree. And I, I, I mean, I, I left journalism. I don't want to do that. I want to make stuff up. Mm. Um, I just have finished a book. It's in Proust now that has its antecedents in, in these things that have happened, but none of them, it, it's like, you know, once again, I'll be telling people like, yes, I know that girls have, been pregnant at their prom and ended up delivering babies and those babies have died none of those stories are this story these are three people i made up it's just it's so that's what i like about jerry he makes stuff up and he gets it and he gets it yeah yeah and uh a little all about eve at the ending uh oh yeah <laughs> very much so i, I think that. yeah all about eve and um i think even you know, there's some some famous horror stories where one person is subsumed by another at the end. Yeah, yeah. It, it's almost like she's contracting the virus of writing. She's yes. initially scorned yes. at the she's notion you would spend your time on your own making stuff up. And, and then gradually she's sitting in the up meetings and she's adopting the attitudes. It's it's hilarious. And also, yeah, it's, it is like Eve and the mirrors and the whole thing dissolves. Um, that brings us, I'm going to leap forward because, of course, you wrote about all of this. 12 years ago uh, in a wonderful novel called Life Sentences, which uh, the opening of which I've been, I teach because it neatly eg exemplifies two things. One of which is this wonderfully fluent, close third, haughty style that Cassandra Fellows, isn't that her, is that her name? The character's name? Yeah. I think so. I'm really yeah, bad at my Fellows, own character's Fellows, name. Um, and, and, um, but it raises the idea that, that memoir, creative nonfiction, might use some of the life that's needed to sustain fiction, but it also, in that scene, someone in her audience, she's written two mem memoirs, and then she's written a novel that she concedes and no, that isn't as good or isn't good enough, and no one is happy with it, and she's anxious that she's used it all up. She used it all up on the memoir. She doesn't have enough. But then in the audience, one of one of the um, uh, people says, um, who get, how, how do you get to write the story? Why do you get to write the story? Mm -hmm. and that, that and question think, keeps yeah. yeah that speaks to what what you were just saying um and she says i think I, i've probably read it more recently than you have <laughs> definitely <laughs> i do because i'm the writer you know yes um because i sit down and i do it and this is yeah. actually something so I, this is something like i'm not against the marvel universe i'm not necessarily anti-superhero Mm. But we have all of these um, spheres of intellectual property that just keep producing and producing and producing. And I've made it clear that there's there's content where you never thought was there was content. You know, there yeah, are yeah. things to be done. Um, yeah. You know, I was trying to catch up with Cobra Kai. <laughs> like, who okay. knew that the Karate Kid could produce these worlds upon worlds upon worlds? Mm. And I think one of the things that's happening is everyone's kind of walking around now thinking they're their own little planet of um, intellectual property. Everyone's right. like, I'm my own IP. Mm. And you might be, you kind of are, but if you can't write it, you can't write it. Yeah. And uh, I mean, this is, I, I've, I've published the one book of essays and I'm working on another personal essay after taking a big break in which I'm going to be talking about some family stuff that is hard. Um, and I think one of the things that kind of broke my heart is my sister who's had some real health challenges and now has to live in assisted living. Um, she's always super private and I always did really hold her harmless. So Tess Monaghan doesn't have siblings because I didn't want my sister ever to say, is that me? And there, yeah. 
I mean, my sister still, my sister still manages to find herself in my books all the time, despite me being intent on not putting her in there. <laughs> but for the most part, I've never written about her. Mm-hmm. And on the day that she entered into assisted living, she said, well, I guess you can write about this. And at first I said, no, I'll never write about this. And now here it is a year later. And it's not the primary story, but it is part of the story. And so I, I confessed to her on Sunday and she got it though. I was like, I said, I'm going to write a novel, of, uh, not a no- novel. I'm going to write an essay. And it's about how everyone in our family is falling down. <laughs> and she's like, well, I guess I have to be in it. And I'm like, yeah, you were the first, you were the trendsetter. Hmm. And then I fell down and did, um, great damage to the shoulder and now my mother has fallen down and it's just like and 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 every appliance in my house is falling apart but anyway that is i mean i'm very mindful of these things when it comes to my own relatives and friends yeah i've been careful i think not to do anything that would embarrass or mortify and certainly not take a story from someone else who was intending to write it Mm. But I don't know. I mean, again, my answer is changing. I'm more compassionate. The next time I work from something that is clearly based on a certain person, I think I would reach out to their family or to them ahead of time. But how can you know? I mean, I think I think you articulated that very well because you're normally the confidence trick of, oh, this might work, but it might fall apart at any moment. And this character, I reserve the right, you know, halfway through, three quarters of the way through, nine tenths of the way through the second draft to remove this character entirely, you know. And and at a certain point, they're not a real person anymore. They're they've they've transmuted. It's it, it it's very. It would be very difficult to set ground rules. I I. Yeah, it is really difficult. And you think of the books that wouldn't exist, and then there, there are arguments that, well, maybe it would be better if those books didn't exist. And why did he get to tell the story? And mm. It's a mess. It's a mess. I'm doing, I'm, I guess all I can say is I try to be the most ethical person I can. Mm. Um, and, you know, everyone loves that. What is it? Is it? It's the Janet Malcolm quote, right? Or is it Janet Malcolm quoting Joan Didion? Oh, about, all writers are thieves or, yeah. Uh, yeah, and or like no no writer. And I just, I just can't get on board with that. I just can't. Maybe it's a little praxis. It's a little bit of that and a little bit. So, so I'm going to say this because, you know, you wrote Life Sentences years ago exploring that. Um, not just that, uh, uh, but, 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 but that, you know, the life, the fiction, how they feed in and back forth. What, what? But you know, when I read, I love um, um, uh, the my life as a villainous and and and. Um, but but I don't believe in the things you're saying. I don't believe you're necessarily telling me the truth. They're not written like in a confessional. And I want to draw a distinction. Here. They're not written in that confessional, personal essay mode. That sometimes when I'm reading it and I'm thinking, why do we need to know this? It would be this would be better between you and your therapist, you know. Um, it's it. I am very uncomfortable. I wish you'd, I wish you'd done the work of making this up to to a sufficient extent. Even finding an avatar with the same name as you, who 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 has enough give and you know uh, 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 th- that 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 we can we can we can we can feel involved, but we don't have to take it completely seriously. Do you do you understand what I'm saying? I do. I do. And there was this terrible, terrible phase in American journalism, often online, in which, and it was definitely young women Mm. were encouraged to write the most embarrassing things about themselves, you know, and that that was considered edgy. And I, this stuff lives forever. And I've been aware of that. I was aware of that actually pretty early on. I tried to write an essay about this when I was still at the newspaper in 2000. I wrote a piece about a young woman who did a first person piece about using female Viagra. And the piece got spiked because my editor, he couldn't envision a world in which your words would always be accessible to people. Right. He couldn't see that 
And, you know, now you have people who have to scrub their tweets every now and then because anyway, they can go back in your tweets and find something and take it out of context or the world is moving so quickly that something that you said three years ago might be considered offensive today. And so those things come back. And yeah, I, I mean, I still feel that as an essayist, I am under no obligation to tell people everything. Yeah. I don't think I should lie or make stuff up. I don't think I should even mislead people, but there, you know, there's certain parts of my life that are like, no, I'm not going to write about that. And this every time up. I sit down, yeah, I mean, Sorry, every time I sit down to write a personal essay, it's like, okay, how, what am I really writing about? Because I'm really writing more about ideas that my life happens to illustrate. It's not, I mean, I'm in it and it's kind of about me. But one of the interesting things I found out writing essays was that the more specific I got, the more universal the essay became. So when I wrote about being really old when my daughter was born, every mom at my kid's school, it was like, oh, I totally got that. Hmm. Which was interesting to me because I'm pretty like, I'm 51, I've had a kid, or you know, and I have this unusual career because it is an unusual career and i'm living in two places and i'm exhausted and and mothers at my school who are very young women who were staying at home with their kids full time they were like oh my god i still got what you're writing about and mothers who had high power jobs and were traveling around the world all the time they're like i totally get it and i was like this is so interesting i wrote what i thought was this very specific story about myself and, and it was a story about how do you choose to become a parent? And there's no right answer to it. And there, and there's definitely, you can't tell people you must do it. Um, in most cases, I don't think you should tell people you shouldn't do it. Although there's some people who shouldn't become parents, but it's just so personal and it's so unexpected that all you can do is just sort of observe it. And, you know, I was just observing what it was like. And, and it was really about how does my daughter see me and how do I want my daughter to see me? Because I'm so much older than the other moms. Hmm. And you're aware that kids notice that stuff. So it's like, you know, I really want my kid to see me as strong and spontaneous and funny and capable. And so don't we all just want to choose how our kids are going to see us. Yeah. That was all. Awesome. It's interesting what you say about, uh, 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 for me, the, the idea of the culture demanding greater degree of, of personal revelation from women than from men. Um, uh, Anne Enright wrote a new introduction to Nuala Ofuelon's second volume of memoir, Almost There, recently. And it's a very self-revelatory, punishingly self-revelatory book. And she, Anne, Anne was kind of questioning, you know, is is a book not enough? Would it would 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 the same level of of self revelation be demanded of a of a of a of a man as of of a woman? Um, and uh, I I I wonder. Um... It, it is interesting. I don't know. I, I think sometimes men offer a lot of information, but they're not punished for it in the same way. They're not judged for it in the same way. Yeah. Um, I'm currently reading the posthumous memoir of Mary Rogers, the daughter of Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein. Mm -hmm. And she co-wrote it with the theater writer, Jess Green for the New York times. And the thing that has impressed me about it is she's super, super honest in a way that feels she she knows how to tell you a lot without telling you everything. Sure. I mean, I, I was telling some friends today, she, she married very young in her 20s and had three kids. First husband was gay and the marriage didn't work out. And she writes with such generosity toward that husband who was, who was violent to her during the marriage. Mm -hmm. And she's like, look, it must have just been hell to be a gay man in the 1950s. Right. Who, you know, it was like that, that was a, and it's like, it was difficult to be him. It was difficult to be me. And once we got through the divorce, he became actually a pretty good father to his kids and a pretty good ex-husband. 
And she has about three and a half years. She's in her 20s. She's trying to work full time. She has three kids. And she's just managing to kind of have affair after affair after affair. And she just mentions them kind of breezily. And, yes. she's, and she's just like, I think I want to she's like, oh, come on, don't judge me. Or it's just like, <laughs> and she, um, she's, it's, it's a fascinating book to me because she, the beans that she really spills are about creative stuff. Yeah, like you're, it's the backstory of the things that she wrote, the things that her father wrote, and this sense that she kind of forgives almost everybody. You know, her father is kind of a terrible man in a lot of ways, but she's okay with it. So I think she somehow managed the tone, and maybe it was because she was writing with somebody else. Right. So there was sort of a, a bit of a bit, bit of protection in that. Rogers Cues Hammerstein, let's go back. Uh, you're the daughter of a children's librarian. You said you 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 started dreaming of being a novelist uh, uh, at the age of twelve. Was was Betsy Ray anything to do with that? Um, oh yes, absolutely. Of the Betsy Tacy books, Betsy Ray is my all time favorite. I this is controversial opinion. <laughs> I hold Betsy Ray of the Betsy Tacy books by My Heart Lovelace in higher esteem than I hold Joe March of Little Women. Okay. I'm, I, I just think Betsy is, I like Betsy better. That's all it comes down to. I don't think I would like Joe very much. And Joe is a bit of a disappointment. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, just settling down with that old man and that, raising all those boys in a big house. So I just, um, I love Betsy Ray. I think she is one of the great, heroines for young readers because she's just a middle-class girl from a small town who wants to write yeah. and her family takes her seriously from the from like the time she's age six mm -hmm. and so it's like early 20th century and it's like of course you're going to grow up to be a writer of course you're going to be great of course you're wonderful of course you should publish and yeah. I, th they were just lovely and they were a huge influence my, my daughter isabel reads them every year uh, mm. all of them yeah. Please tell her I have been to Mankato, I have climbed the big hill, and yeah. I have seen the houses in which Betsy and Tacey grew up. Fantastic. Uh, we've got to go there, uh, she and I. Um, was it maybe being a crime reporter that lit the sort of lamp for, for crime fiction uh, as a way to go? I think it was loving crime, crime fiction, first of all. Mm -hmm. and. There was something, first of all, it felt accessible. You know, there was definitely the, I just have to nail the plot points. I just have to kill somebody and uncover who killed that person in a satisfying manner. But I think also there was always this awareness of, you know, I, I read a lot of mainstream fiction. I liked to, I liked to be thought of as smart. Mm. But, oh. Uh, it just there was a pushback against sort of the snobbery inherent in people who think that reading should be difficult and kind of unpleasant. Mm -hmm. sure. it, I, like it's one thing. I mean, there are a lot of people who I believe read Penchon for pleasure. I'm not one of them, but I don't doubt it. Mm -hmm. I, I can see how that could be, and and I'm happy for them. And I'm happy for people who find pleasure in difficulty, as in, yes, this is hard, but I like it. Mm -hmm. I can get that. But there's another class of reader that's just like, we have to read the things that we have to read because these are the things we have to read. And it, it's, it's almost like they've lost um, faith with the idea that reading is, should be entertaining. Yeah. Like you should be having a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Whatever you're and, reading, and and going back to your your childhood, uh, I I saw someone um, uh, talking about Enid Blyton in this way, who by many standards is is not a good writer, but the relationship, and this is a published author talking about this, he had with Enid Blyton as a, an eight and a nine year old child. He he thinks he's never quite had the same degree of intensity and obsession, but he's always searching for for this a similar feeling. So I think I think maybe our relationship sometimes with with crime fiction is 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 in that zone. 
Right. Yeah. Because I was reading, well, you know, first of all, I, I didn't like Nancy Drew, but I did read these books about the happy Hollisters. Mm -hmm. And I loved Encyclopedia Brown where you solved it yourself. And I liked, there was another sleuth, teen sleuth named Trixie Belden. And one of the best books I've ever read, I'm not qualifying in any way. One of the best books I've ever read is from the mixed up files of Mrs. Bosley Frankweiler, which is about two children who run away and hide in the Metropolitan Museum of Art and then decide to try to figure out if this mysterious statue really is a Michelangelo. And so it's a mystery and it's just incredibly satisfying and smart about secrets and adventures and how, you know, pampered children might need to challenge themselves and change a little bit. So I, I also think there's a way that you read like up to age 25 that you simply stop reading as you get older. And it's why, it's why Marjorie Morningstar is this huge touchstone for me because it's just, it's the most improbable book in the world. And it's, is it well-written? I think so. I don't know. I'm just kind of obsessed with it. Yeah. And you don't, you know, the obsessions, I think, slow down a lot. But, you know, I, so I think I started because I could see the blueprint for how a crime novel was put together. And I liked crime novels. And I, you know, I, I think that I didn't, well, let's be honest. I think that, if I had gone to hang out with the snob crowd, I was going to fall short. I just didn't feel that that was a group that would accept me. I'm sometimes very surprised, even now, when really, really smart mainstream literary writers seem to like me and my work. That's still mm -hmm. kind of a shock. Makes me, you know, remember that you know everyone's not a snob and. A lot of people do remember that we're here to read for pleasure. Um, but once I was there, once I was deep into the crime world, and I would meet writers who would be like, I used to write crime fiction, but now I write literary fiction. Mm. Which my sister would always say, I think someone else gets to make that determination. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. But I mean, I, I kind of understood it. I understood, I always understood the desire to be taken more seriously, to be seen as someone who's smart and good at what you do. But I just figured out pretty quickly that crime fiction held all the opportunities in the world. Hmm. It was like being in a huge, beautiful store. And if at the end of the day, I couldn't assemble all the materials into making something as gorgeous as I liked. Well, that was on me, but it wasn't on crime fiction. There was just, where were the limits? You don't even have to kill somebody. Did you feel part of, I mean, there was a, there was a big wave in the, in, in the late 90s, you know, Michael Connolly, Dennis Lehane, uh, George Pelicanos, Walter Mosley. Did you feel... You were part of that. You were, you know, here we come walking down the street. Um, you know, that I, that I feel like Michael Connolly was sort of everybody's big brother. He was a little bit ahead of everybody, a little bit ahead of the curve, and Mosley also, but Connolly in particular, is just he's such a sweetheart and he's just so modest and unassuming. And like if you try to talk to him about how he does what he does or how he became so successful, he acts He's not acting. Like, he's just no, an aw shucks kind of person. He's very modest, yeah. But it happened that a group of people began writing crime fiction in the mid to late 90s. And it was sort of being part of a high school class. Like, oh, we all came in together. We're going to graduate together. And it was, and it was really varied. It was, you know, Harlan Coben and Dennis Lehane and Pelicanos. I was part of it, and now I'm feeling, now I'm getting upset because I'm trying to remember more women who were part of that class. On the hard-boiled side, mm. on the cozier side, that was the time when Sujata Masi came along and began doing work that strikes me as even more surprising when you think about someone writing a, writing a cozy series set in Japan about a biracial amateur sleuth, and this is, you know, ended up with Sujata now writing these amazing historical mysteries 
about a lawyer in India in the 1920s. And it's just like, that seems you know, just amazing to me that these books exist in some ways or that the seeds for them were in the 90s. But yeah, I think there was a group of us who felt like S.J. Roseanne is one of the women who's very right, much yeah, part yeah. of the group. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was like, hey, why are we all here? How did we all end up doing this thing at the same time? And I know for some of us, it was because we were all, there were several of us who were really enamored with the social novel, hmm. you know, that, that, and that just wasn't being done in mainstream literary fiction at the time. Yeah. And I, I know he doesn't, I love Theodore Dreiser. I know he doesn't write the prettiest sentences, sentences, but his insight into what people feel and think, his empathy is just so amazing. And it's like, I'll let him write a clunker because you read a book like Sister Carrie where he has reasoned but not over the top empathy, even for her, sedu her seducers. Mm -hmm. It's like even those, you know, like, yeah, they're bad men, but you understand why. So I love Dreiser and I love novels about social problems. And the crime novel was so was such a good vehicle. The other topic I love, and people write about it a lot now, but I love writing about money. Mm -hmm. Why do I mean, money is one of the greatest subjects. Everybody's mm -hmm. weird about it, I, myself included. Everyone is weird about money. And, you know, whether you're reading Madame Bovary, where the money matters so much, or Mildred Pierce, where the money matters so much, where it's like literally about accounting fraud and there are two sets of books and why is there accounting fraud because this middle class woman who's clawed her way into the upper middle class now has to pretend that she's got a level of wealth she doesn't have in order to pacify her incredibly ungrateful daughter so i felt like the absence of money stories and the absence of stories about social problems the crime fiction was just there like we'll do it <laughs> we'll take that on and I think I think now you find a lot more mainstream fiction that's interested in those topics. Yeah, um, it, it's interesting. You were talking about the cozies earlier, the, the, the what's so called traditional mystery. And and you know when I when I first started uh, publishing in mid two thousands, um, it was nothing to be on a panel and and just refer you know derisively to to Agatha Christie or to Murder at the Vicarage or to all that country house nonsense. You know, and nobody really would bat an eyelid. And the way in which and I think it's something to do with the revival of or the rise of whatever you want to call it, domestic suspense, suburban noir, which is kind of a subgenre you've been writing since, you know, your first standalone, certainly, and arguably in some of the test books as well. Um, you, you were you were covering that waterfront, um, which, of course, goes back to Highsmith and goes back to Margaret Miller and goes back to a lot of other writers not so well known. But, um, but one of the interesting phenomena that occurred in that is that Publishers seeing, you know, Gone Girl was selling like hotcakes and The Girl in the Train seemed to push uh, the authors of, quote unquote, women's fiction to say, why, mm -hmm. why, don't you, why don't you go in there? What you need is a big dose of either sex or, or money or preferably both as Just as motives. Drop a body. Yeah. And 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 see and see how you get on. And that's been very fruitful, I think, for it's been a good match for for maybe writers who had who had maybe written five or six books and had kind of run out of road or weren't sure where to go next. Um, so I, I appreciate your thoughts on, on that. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, I do remember when people, people were very nasty about Agatha Christie. Mm. And, you know, there is, there are some issues of, you know, snobbery within her work, some, you know, problematic parts. But come on, you, you just, she's a phenomenon. I think the number three best-selling writer of all time behind, or it's like the Bible and Christie or the Bible. And I can't remember, no, and Agatha Christie. And it's just like, nothing it's comes close. Lord honest. of the Rings. Yeah. I, I don't Maybe know. that's it. It's just, you know, she, her success. Well, I mean, you know, it begins, it begins with that Raymond Chandler essay, The Simple Art of Murder. It is my contention. I'm sure there's some examples I haven't found yet. But every essay I've ever read about this is what a novel should be 
every single one of those essays I've ever read has been written by a man who is telling you that the kind of novel he writes is the perfect novel. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Tom Wolf, um, Jonathan Franzen did it. Yeah. Chandler did it. And there's one other person who wrote, like, and like, I'm sure there are other essays, but people are like, a novel should be this. They're writing an advertisement for the kind of novel they are writing or wish to write. Mm. So um, I like Raymond Chandler. He must have been a very insecure person because as brilliant as he was, he was so vicious to the writers. Yeah. So he's, um, he's vicious to Christie. He's vicious to Sayers. He's... I don't remember, I, he's, he's definitely vicious to James Cain behind his back. <laughs> he's, I think he's vicious to Tashel Hammett. Mm. I mean, at the end of the day, Raymond Chandler is one of our great writers who wrote maybe eight books, <laughs> yeah. like, um, had, had a slight productivity problem and I know he died probably young, but so, yeah, that was a bit, you, you, it's hard not to look at the criticism of Agatha Christie and not see sexism. Yeah, yeah. What's that yeah. about? I mean, because we're, we're forgiving problematic stuff in other people's work, but it's like, oh, you know, and I also think that why are we deriding a traditional mystery? The murder of someone within intimate circles is a great story. Mm -hmm. I mean, heck, there's just been a movie review released in the States called Bodies, 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 which is an attempt to, to take, take a more modern perspective on that. And I'm dying to see it because I, and what was interesting to me is that traditional mysteries became really, really popular during the pandemic. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's, it was easy. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. There is a lot of low, but by the way, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in hard boiled novels. Like there's, there's not, there's not a genre around that doesn't have stuff that's easily mocked. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, okay. Yes. In the cozy, there were cats that solved mysteries, but what a lot of people probably don't remember is there was a series of books about a PI who was really a dinosaur. <laughs> 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 We're all dinosaurs, Laura. <laughs> you know what? I, ju I just missed how meta that was. That was it. I mean, They're it was all dinosaurs. They all over my head. That is, but, alas, a subgenre that's in abeyance at the moment, by and large. Yeah. Uh, so, and these yeah. things come in, in, in fashion. But I do think, I mean, women and, and, and the rise of, not the rise of, but the surge of female writers in the past 10, 12 years has been a phenomenon of... Uh, uh, of of crime fiction that's that's highly visible and most notable uh, trend. I mean, the women women are the fiction readers, and there's mm. the famous story about Ian McEwen when he's profiled in the New Yorker. He tried to clear out his library, and he just took books to the park and was trying to hand them out. And men wouldn't take novels, and he said, "When women stop reading the novel, the novel is dead." Um, so it's it's interesting to me because women were sort of holding whether it was crime fiction. I can't speak as authoritatively about science fiction. Maybe that was different, but I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, women are the readers of fiction. Mm -hmm. And how do women die in Western cultures? Generally, women who are murder victims in Western culture are victims of someone known to them. Generally, that's the most common way. If, if a woman's going to be murdered, so why wouldn't they want to read these stories? I mean, yeah. who doesn't want to read stories that they can relate to? And, you know, every woman I know has a story about a scary encounter, being stalked, um, you know, an intimate relationship that became shockingly violent with seemingly no foreshadowing. So it's, I, you know, yeah. I mean, and I thought that, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just, I know in the States we had the big um, crime conference over the weekend. I didn't go. And I said to a friend, I was like, I'm just, I, I'm not up for hearing old white men complain that they can't get published because no one's interested in their stories. I just don't think that's true. 
Sure. I just think there are a lot of other stories that are rushing in that people are also interested in. And they're like, I'm, I'm kind of tired of reading about, you know, that guy. And we know who that guy is. He's, he's alone and wounded and something bad happened to him. Sure. He either has a bad habit or he's gotten over his bad habit, but it still tempts him. And <laughs> women just fall into his lap and what can he do about it? And I, yeah, it's like, there are a lot of really good books that fit that template I just described. There are also a lot of just really ordinary ones. And at this point, I don't think you can get away with writing an average book about a male protagonist who solves crimes. I, there's, there's just too many. You have to just write a really good one, which is the advice over and over again for people who are frustrated, which is maybe you're going to have to write a better book. I don't know. Good, good advice. I'm, I'm going to hand over to uh, mm -hmm. Vanessa. I just have one last question. You, you raised the shiny specter of the um, Lady in the Lake production. Can you give us a, a few more uh, tantalizing details? All I can tell you is I only visit, I've only visited set once and to my shock, they're almost done. It was an incredibly long shoot of almost a hundred days. I went to set when they were filming a pretty big fraught scene at the end of the book. Natalie Portman is perfection as mm. Mandy Schwartz. I mean, everyone should be so lucky as to see someone they made up in their head show up on the set of a TV show and be like, oh my God, you're perfect. And the clothes are perfect. And every, I mean, it's, it's going to be very different. I've, I've read some of the scripts and this is very much the director's project. This is her work now. And I'm always cool with that. So mm. I'm, I'm really happy. I mean, but the main thing I was happy about is it brought all these jobs to Baltimore. And the day that I went to set and I'm standing at base camp and I'm just surrounded by trucks and buses and people with jobs. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I sat in a room and I made some stuff up and a lot of people got a summer's worth of work out of it. So that Fantastic. was pretty cool. Fantastic. I have a I have another hour's worth of index cards, but unfortunately, uh, I, I don't think they'll they'll take two hours of us. Uh, Sam, have you some some last questions for for Laura? I think you've done a fantastic job there, Jacqueline. You've absolutely got everything um, covered. I had questions about your favourite book, Laura, and um, other bits, and you've covered everything. So that's been an absolutely marvellous interview. Um, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you to Jacqueline Hughes and to the amazing Laura Lipman for joining us. Um, thank you very much indeed to Rathdown, uh, Dunley and Rathdown Libraries for hosting Murder One and for the Arts Council for uh, helping to fund us. Um, I do hope you can join us online. Um, um, to everybody who's watching um, or in person at Murder One, uh, which is, uh, this is our first major event. So we will be playing out across the rest of the week uh, and all the details are at murderone.ie. So on that note, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.